thanks everyone for coming. It's really great to see you. Um, I'm Sarah Gove. I'm Housing Communities Manager at Fenland. As, as Joe said, unfortunately, Councillor Hoy can't be with us, but she was desperate to get a message to you all. And basically, you know, we've got a really packed agenda for tonight. And thank you um, to FDC colleagues and all of the speakers for making this event happen. As you all know, we're always keen to engage with landlords and agents and to ensure we keep you all up to speed with topics that are useful to you. And I would encourage you to ask questions or contact the team afterwards if you need any help. Thank you all for what you do for our local community. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the future. And I'll hand back over to you, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so as you can see, everybody from the itinerary um, that I distributed distributed um, yesterday, we've got a very packed agenda this evening covering a diverse subject relating sub sorry a diverse amount of subjects relating to the private sector. Um, each contributor has presented their slideshow. There'll be an opportunity to um, ask questions. So if you do have a question, if you could just raise your hand at the end. Um, alternatively, you can post your questions in the chat facility during the presentation if you wish to. So um, let's get on. We're going to kick off with Richard. Um, Richard is a, a private landlord within the Fenland district and like others is having to adapt strategies due to the increase of the cost of living. Um, and like most of you who have felt the impact, um, particularly where energy costs are concerned, um, he's offered to share some uh, hints and tips that you might find useful. So if I could pass over to Richard, um, Andy, if you could put up Richard's presentation, if that's OK. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Smashing. Great, good. Am I OK to start? Cool. So good evening, everyone. I um, hope you're all feeling good. And uh, I wanted to share with you some sort of pertinent tactics I've had to sort of employ to, to mitigate local risks to energy wastage across our portfolio. I'm not an electric or gas or water usage guru, but my experience has stemmed from on the ground experience with our houses, conversations with stakeholders and information I've gleaned from networks. Linked to this point, I'm probably not going to be able to impact your current tariffs, um, however, maybe able to impact on potential wastage. I wanted to see if I could Personally, I wanted to see if I could mitigate risks of rent rises by good old fashioned engagement across all our stakeholders involved in our business. Hope you find my experiences compelling and provide food for thought. The presentation takes three parts, local actions, external actions, summary, and I look forward to any questions following the presentation. Uh, next slide, Andy, please. Okay, so local actions. Um, I do and have done so for the past sort of three years, energy focus inspections on all of my properties. These take the form of communal areas and rooms, particularly HMO specific. Um, and key things that I look out for in houses are the temperature, electric heaters, radiators on and windows open, data mining for crypto, rogue appliances and weed farms. Not come across any weed farms yet, but I do nonetheless look for all those other key areas. Um, and lots of experiences, particularly over the winter months where you find the heaters, as in you've seen in the photos. Um, but it, I find that these inspections really do help with the engagement with the tenants to help them and educate them in understanding how to manage energy um, and to, to obviously to manage my bills. Um, so those inspections I do with, with my lettings manager as well, and we're always talking openly about how we can improve things. So linked to that, the tenant engagement is crucial. Um, you know, I was only doing inspections and visits um, in the last couple of weeks, and we're talking about radiators being on and, and windows open, which is, you know, every HMO um, landlord's sort of frustration. But I was explaining to the tenant that, you shouldn't do this because the, the you know the warm air is going straight out the window etc um but but also that engagement is you know through conversations and helps me get my tenants on site so they understand where you know my threats to my businesses are 
um, whilst keeping them you know, safe, warm um, and sort of topped up with water. Um, I guess locally, what one of the things you can do is, and, and I have done in all my HMOs, is to in, in implement smart thermostats. There's a number on the market, the majority of which you have to buy online, um, but they control heating, um, but automatically remove boilers from any boost after a period of time. So if you haven't got these, the, basically what they do, they're normal thermostats, they can be boosted up and down, um, uh, but however, they're on timed, so you, they won't be boosted all day, they will fall off the boost um, after a, a set amount of time. That that certainly does help, um, and the they can be programmed, obviously, alongside any other thermostats, but they're quite smart, just in, implemented some wireless ones and ones I can remotely operate that also have the, the boost controls as well. So there's there's a fair few out there at the moment, but they, they're pretty much online purchases. Um, a little tactic I kind of used and, and have used on, on a lot of my sort of appliances in the properties is, is save energy stickers. Um, so they're next to light switches in the picture. You can see a cooker hood with the save, um, save energy on them. Uh, they're really visible to tenants. Um, I hope and it, it empowers the tenants just to kind of think, you know what, I do need to turn this off. We do need to save energy. Um, and, the, you know, they're, they're all way right through our houses at the moment. And I think it kind of matches this sort of the, the national and international picture um, that everyone is on everyone's lips at the moment, the cost of living crisis, et cetera, and things like that. So I think little things like this can go a long way. Again, they can be purchased for you know, 10 to 15 pounds from all online retailers um, that would supply this sort of thing. Um, moving on to sort of immersion heaters. Um, a lot of the older properties will have these. Uh, I've taken a few out, but unfortunately I left one in. Um, these can be, these are like boiling kettles for your whole day if they're kept on. Um, and I didn't realize it was on um because it was sort of snuck away um i did actually an inspection with an electrician because i was so concerned about this particular property and it, it really came to a head that it was the immersion heater that had been left on it was it was boiling hot and, and had been boiling hot for a year or so um the, obviously turned it off straight away um but this has had a massive impact on on savings particularly um since sort of turning off so and i've just so done my sort of year end accounts and there's a huge difference between what I've reporting this year versus what I reported last year. Um, so good tactic there to, to have a look at those immersion heaters. And, and, you know, if you know a friendly electrician, do go around your properties with an, with an electrician because they can really be helpful or plumber, et cetera, um, or heating engineer. Um, sounds really simple, the next point, but re always report the meter readings in the times that your supplier wants them. Um, I do these without fail um, monthly um, and it is annoying and it is frustrating, but I, I, I've seen what the utilities companies do um, when they are providing their own estimates and they're not estimates on, you know, well, I don't know, the finger in the air time and what they can get away with. Um, but it does reduce the risk of estimated billing um, and it does increase the control that you feel personally that you have on your property so it's a real proactive way of doing it what i also do with with my meter readings is that i log them um, on spreadsheets and i look at usage <coughs> excuse me and that gives me patterns that i can look at um that i know that you know winter season is going to be tough for example summer not so tough um but it also helps me look at real where spikes are so for example i've seen a recent spike in one of the properties so I've, I've been over to the property to do one of my inspections to see what's going on. And guess what? It was an electric heater. So that's the, the local actions. There are many more that you can do, but there are some things that have, have really supported me um, from doing those. So next slide, Andy. So external actions. This, for me, this is where the fun has been, really. Um, I've had in, inaccurate meters. Um, so it is very much worth asking your utility supplier to measure your meters performance. Um, 
if inaccurate, they'll be replaced at no cost and you can claim overspend historically. Um, how do you know a meter? How do you get a feeling that your meter's sort of not performing right? It, it, because I feel like I'm really close to the properties, I, I kind of feel when I'm looking at comparisons between one property to another, the f and one property is far, you know, vastly different from another. That's where uh, I, I guess I, I then look at the think of the meter. You know, in some of these meters in these 100, 100 year old plus houses are, are, are very old, uh, and some of them are 30, 40 years old. <clears throat> and you know, do should we be expected to be running the you know same speed as if we were if we were sort of fifteen years old? But you know, to compare to someone who's a sort of forty-five year old, you know, like myself. So I think um, they do go wrong. Um, and again, measuring them, um, what the utility companies will do is they will get a third party involved. They might charge you a hundred quid. Um, if the meter isn't running incorrectly, um, that the third party will come out, measure your meter, they'll give you an answer there and then. In this particular case, it was 15%. Um, it was running fast. <clears throat> and I was able to then go back to my supplier, um, reclaim a refund historically. And then I was also able to re reclaim a, a historical refund from the previous supplier as well. Um, so um, it takes a bit of, uh, I, I guess, time and energy, but it's really worth um, perhaps looking at those meters because they might be able to su support refunds. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so um, EPCs, um, embrace the concept. <coughs> Partner with a local EPC assessor. And it's worth appraising, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> uh, so yeah, partner with a local EPC assessor and it's worth appraising the property um, before the 10 year period runs out, especially if the property has been refurbished. Also benefits for remortgaging and refinancing with particular lenders. Um, and those EPC meetings that you have with the assessors they can give you a real insight as to how your property is performing. And if it is as simple as, you know, putting loft insulation in, because plenty of houses don't, then, you know, that doesn't take too much money to, to, to put that insulation in. Um, but definitely worth doing the EPC straight after you've done a refurbishment or you've done some works to the property. Uh, next point, VAT declarations. So I never... I, I never knew about any of this um, until I would sort of spoken to people in my network. But basically, you can, if you want be a business utility contract, you can gain a VAT refund, particularly if your meters are domestic or residential, you can claim. So, but if the business meters on business tariffs, you can't, that will always be 20%. But if you're on a business contract with domestic residential meters, then you only have to pay 5%. And if you go for a certain amount, they'll try and charge you 20% when they shouldn't. So I guess on all the, the suppliers' websites, it there will be a section on there that states about VAT declarations. You just need to fill one of those forms out. They're very simple, uh, basically tick boxes. They submit them um, and they will come back and they will change uh, your VAT. They'll also go and do it historically as well for the time that you've been with that supplier. Um, so again, that's a good source of refunds that I've experienced um, from doing VAT declarations um, on your properties. Next point is, is really about understanding the bills. Kilowatts per hour standing charges can be very complicated. Uh, establish patterns of usage compare properties, why are there spikes and falls and get an average per month. Um, kilowatts per hour is a really difficult one because it's like a silent ticking that goes on. But um, if you do log your meter reads and you do look at your bills and, and compare between properties, you definitely can <coughs> look at, um, definitely can, sort of understand the bill and where the billings and don't be frightened to ask your utilities company 
why they've charged what they've charged. Um, I do that all the time. Um, and some things it might be my fault that I've uploaded the meter reading wrong, but um, it, it does help. <coughs> um, next point is um, end, end of contracts and uh, energy supply collapse. Just be savvy. Research new suppliers, don't commit until the market has been explored by yourself. I'm in the process of doing this for gas on two properties. And I'm you know, looking at sort of steep climbs in terms of you know, what I've looked at versus what I'm paying at the moment. The, I guess I will keep going, but you do this, you've got 49 days before end of contract um, where you can actually change. So I'm using that 49 days to, to really explore um, as it stands at the moment, I'm veering most of my properties onto res sort of residential domestic contracts rather than business um, because the um, the meters are residential and domestic um, and therefore I'm able to sort of um, to, to take on sort of normal residential rates, which I think at the moment is slight, uh, on, a, on a par with business, um, but they're more variable. <coughs> the variable rather than fixed because no one's really fixing at the moment although that from talking with the market there does appear to be um more fixed products coming back onto the market um as a result of um reduced gas prices etc and things like that um just to note on energy supply collapse um when offgem takes you on to a new company um they are sharking it big time and they're making phone calls getting onto contracts just by verbal um confirmation over a telephone um try try not to try to end the call try to then explore the market rather than going for what they're saying <clears throat> <coughs> next point is about customer service um we've all been talking we've all had to talk to bots we all have to talk to you know the guys at the other end of the phone um, when talking about talking to utilities companies um, I, I kind of use words such as complaint in my communication um, you know if, if nothing's been resolved because we're using the word complaint automatically means that um, they have to take notice and they have to do something about it um, but alongside that I treat all the employees with respect I plan my calls I ask to speak to managers if I need to I note the date, time and the name of the contact that I'm talking to. I always follow up with an email, even if it's to an info at or, or what have you. It just gives you a paper trail of, of where you've been. Um, and that paper trail can be very, very important, especially when you, if you need, do have to escalate to the Omnisman. Um, and I've escalated to the Omnisman and it took um, a fair amount of time. But because I had paper trails of everything that I've done, the ombudsman actually came down in my favour um, versus, you know, a huge utility supplier. So um, it, it is very much um, about managing your service to those, um, to the guys at the other end of the phone, because at the end of the day, if they don't like you, they're not necessarily going to help you um, and they'll pass you on to the next person because that's kind of how it works. So try and befriend some of them. Um, and again, I've got live examples at the moment where I've needed meters going from um from uh, prepaid to credit meters and it's just taking so much time um and so much kind of effort but we'll get there in the end and it will be worthwhile um uh, next slide andy summary <clears throat> so in summary it's about staying in control for me um, utilities is the biggest cost in my business, therefore I pri prioritise a lot of my activities to do with my portfolio around costs, particularly utilities. <coughs> Be prepared to play the long game. Stamina, time and patience is very much required, um, but you will get there in the end. Generate savings through action. I've received fairly substantial refunds uh, by employing proactive management. and those, Some of those refunds have run into thousands. So that has helped, particularly this year's accounts. Um, generate, uh, sorry, um, engagement with all stakeholders, tenants, lettings, networks, social media posts, utilities companies. 
keep talking about it talk about it with everyone that you come across even in out in the houses talk about it with your tenants with your lettings manager talk about it with the, them use networks um they're all out there hmo group for hmo landlords is, is very good um and you know the most searched on um posts at the moment in in most sort of property and landlords social media is um very much about um utilities and you know ways to try and su support and um, saving costs um and to also utilities companies that there, there's some been some great conversations i had with those guys that have pointed me in the right direction um you know particularly around vat declarations etc um there's plenty of landlord conversations out there regarding fair usage policies inserted into tenancy agreements. Most of them are unenforceable, but implementing technologies such as smart metering by HMO room and raising of rents. <coughs> some of these points, um, some of these points I've made may to support energy usage efficiency without incurring significant costs or disruptions to the tenants. If you go too far, you will cause disruption. If you try and stamp on things, it, the, the tenants are not going to be engaging with you. It's about working in partnership with with everyone to try and um, support the, the kind of energy wastage, et cetera, and things like that. So um, try to keep it. I try to keep it on the ground, which is conversations um, and local actions which support that. But I'm sure that sure that the actions I've aligned uh, uh, not an exhaustive exhaustive list um, therefore I'd love to hear any other initiatives that you could be doing um, to give greater co control of energy usage um, and any questions um, I'm, I'm here for that or in the chat boxes um, apologies for my little cough I've been outside all day <laughs> but thank you very much <laughs> thank you Richard that was really informative I'm sure um, every landlord is probably going to take a little bit of a nugget of your advice there and can adopt that into their own um, portfolio. Um, I noticed that Simon's got a question. Simon, would you like to um, pose your question to um, Richard? Uh, no, because he answered it during the um, oh, okay. during his That's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> See, that shows I was actually paying attention. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> um, is there any more questions for for Richard? I just wanted to know what 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 was in your in your in your pint glass, Richard. Was that beer? No, <laughs> apple and blackcurrant squash. It was either that or port. Yeah, no, yeah, pint of port. We know it's not yeah. <laughs> yeah Re really informative thank you I'm, um I'm, I'm hoping to um to take some of that information and share it with some of the hmo landlords that can't attend and i'm sure that um would would you mind sharing those slides yeah no, joe's got afterwards them. brilliant joe's got them so oh. she can send them on excellent yeah. thank you thank you richard um so uh, if we move on to our next presenter that's nikki uh, we're, we're... oh sorry all right Dan, Dan had raised his hand, but I think oh, it's sorry. already. No, Dan. yeah, I was just I was just really interested in the I've never heard the inaccurate meter uh -huh. point. I was really fascinated by that. And just in terms of how far you could go back in terms of once you've proven, you know, once they've said yes, it is inaccurate by 15 percent. How far back could you go? Was it as long as you had that property or? Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting one because <clears throat> I was only able to go back to two suppliers because my the third supplier went bust. Um, they say there's nothing you can do. Um, I understand, and and I probably need to get this verified. I think you can go back between sort of ten years worth um, if if it's the same meter. Um, but it, I guess it's probably a view from the utilities company. But I think they're they obviously whoever manages them will. Yeah, it's legal. Legally, they have to all run right. Um, so but I think it's about 10 years that I can check on that. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks isn't for it? that. Yeah, very Good. interesting. Thank you. We'll have all our landlords here that we're going and checking all of their um, meters now just to check that they're running properly. <laughs> yeah, it may cost it may cost a hundred pounds if it isn't running fast. And I, that's probably supply specific as to what they would cost um but but certainly if it's running fast it will be replaced free of charge um and and you then set about trying to trying to reclaim the the monies that have been overspent for yeah, yeah up to 10 years 
Lovely. Thank you, Richard. Um, so let's move on then to our next presenter. That's Nikki. Uh, Nikki's from a company called No Letting Go, um, and they um, offer um, landlords a facility, lots of facilities, lots of services. Um, but Nikki's here to talk about uh, minimising disputes at the tenancies. So hopefully you'll find this um, informative and uh, hoping that probably you've not had many occasions where you have had um, disputes at the end. Fingers crossed. Um, but Nick is here to help if you do. Over to you, Nikki. Oh, thank you. Um, have you got our presentation up, please? There we go. Oh, thank you. Um, so my name's Nikki. I'm from a company called No Letting Go. We're uh, primarily a property inventory provider. And um, we're a, if you want to move on to the next slide for me, um, we are, um, we're a franchise organisation. So each of our offices throughout the UK are people's own businesses. Um, so I've got Rob along with me who runs our Kings Lynn office. Um, and he can tell you sort of all the areas he covers. We've got quite good coverage throughout the UK with um, 86 offices we've got now for over the UK. Uh, we've been going since 2007 when the deposit schemes first came about. Um, everybody is, um, is trained to the same high standard. So if you had a report from Edinburgh all the way down to Plymouth, um, you wouldn't know that that was Rob did that report or Janet did that report because um, that's one of our core values is to have consistency. consistency. Um, can we have the, um, can we have the please, please? Um, so I um, we have a famous, we have famous saying at No Letting Go that disputes are settled at the beginning of the tenancy. Um, and that is, you know, if you've got a good inventory at the beginning, um, you really want to make it, you know, if you do it yourself, um, uh, if you do it yourself, make sure it's in a really nice, easy to read format, um, because if it does sit in front of an adjudicator, um, like we have really good relationships with the adjudicators. They really like our reports and um, you know, they want it in an easy to read format. They don't want to see lots of videos, but they like to see the written word because, as we always say, you can't ever take a picture of a smell, but, you know, you can describe what a smell looks like. Um, so make sure it's, um, it's really clear, easy to read and make sure really, really important that you're not just writing down what is in there, you want what is in there, what's there, the condition of it, as well as the um, cleanliness of it. Because as we all know, the most disputes, 85% of disputes are all over cleanliness. Um, so, um, so if you want to move on to the next slide for me, please. So within our reports, we'll have a good, um, we'll have a glossary which explains five levels of clean of condition so one is like brand new number five would be um sort of something scruffy untidy unkempt and then on cleanliness levels number one would be like five star hotel clean and number six would be what we would all deem as disgusting um so you know so you've got really clear evidence written out there um this is an example of um, the one on the left there is a, is an inventory that we actually use for a checkout that was written by a landlord. Um, and then next to it, you can see a no letting go sample report. And if anybody would like any sample reports, you know, more than happy to send them to Jo and she can send them out to you so you can see what they look like. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, as I said earlier, the most common disputes are um, as 85% is cleanliness. The second biggest dispute is gardens and fences. Um, and then, um, you know, obviously you're doing the inventory at the beginning because you're looking at the end game for when they're moving out. You want to minimise all um, any, con any cleanliness and condition issues at the end of it. So at the end, we're looking at damage, cleanliness, 
and we're looking at damage against fair wear and tear um, and the gardening issues. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so this is our glossary that I told you earlier. You can see the five levels of condition and cleanliness. Should we go on to the next one? Um, and here, this is a perfect example of condition versus cleanliness. You know, you've got quite an old aged oven there. Um, there's probably not a good energy rating in our day and age, but um, but as you can see, it's in really good condition. It's spotlessly clean, as opposed to a kitchen worktop we've got on the right that's newly fitted, brand new, but it's all dirty and dusty. You know, so even though it's something new, it's you really have to think about what you're doing. You know, inventories are not quite as easy as everybody thinks they are. Um, can we do the next one, please? Um, you know, so you've done your inventory, you're then going to be doing your check in with your tenant. You know, where I could recommend wherever, you know, do a check in with the tenant. Um, you know, don't let that let you down. If we move on to the next slide. Um, you know, at the um, at the check in, um, we'll go round, you know, or you should go round with your tenant to get them to sign off. We get them to accept the keys when, you know, they're signing for the keys. And then ideally give your tenants seven days to read through their, um, their inventory and come up with any comments. We run a digital service where your tenants can add comments, add photos. If you've got a HMO with 11 people, all 11 can sign it, but only the lead tenant would add comments because we wouldn't want to read through 11 people's comments. Um, but when you're at the property, you know, you can go around, discuss any outstanding maintenance, show them everything that they need to know that's on the inventory. And nine times out of 10, when a tenant is making comments within that seven day period after they've moved in, generally the comments they're putting in are just something that makes the tenant feel better. It starts them off on a good tenancy, you know, the beginning of that new relationship with your tenant. Um, and if it is something that we've missed out, you know, we're all human. We hold our hands up, put an addendum in and put it right. But I promise you sort of like, 9.9% .9 of the time, the stuff the tenants do right doesn't need to be in there. It just makes them feel better. Um, can we go on to the next one, please? Um, so once your tenants moved in, you've got your signed inventory back. You know, a really good thing to do is your midterm inspections. And Richard, I love the way that you do like energy inspections. I think that is such a brilliant idea. Um, you know, I would always recommend do your first inspection after the first month, you know, and as we all know, we're not there to judge how they live. We're just there to make sure our investment is looked after. The midterm inspections are really good for a couple of reasons. A, it gives us an opportunity to educate the tenants, you know, so first time tenants that, um, you know, you want to be talking about ventilation and the washing on the radiators in the winter and there's no windows open, you know, and why mould and mildew is building up. And again, in um, in the in the spring, if they've got a garden, you know, we'd be reminding them to mow. You've got to mow your lawn once a week, the same way you do for your house once a week. Um, so after your after your first inspection, you'll then decide, well, this tenant looks pretty good. I might come back in three months. Then I'd recommend twice a year. Um, if after the first one you sort of they're a bit new and they're just learning how to be tenants, you know, you might do the next inspection in two months. But just um, just, um, you know, sort of judge it from yourself um, there. Can we go on to the next one? Um, so things that we would look for and I'd recommend you look for um, when you go around is obviously the general condition. Any evidence of damp or mould, any education we can give to them, you know, anything we find we report directly to you as a landlord, you know, and if it's something that needs your attention, we'll pick up the phone and tell you straight away. Um, we're looking for um, 
you know, breaches of their tenancy agreement. So not that we would know what was in their tenancy agreement, but it's all the regular stuff, um, you know, subletting, overcrowding, uh, pets, smoking, you know, sort of all the general stuff. And um, and unlike Richard, it was uh, September 21, our Watford office went into a property that had a weed farm. So, you know, they are really, really important to do. So can we have the next slide, please? Um, on the property visits, we normally take two photos of each room. Um, we'd mark out any damage or maintenance issues, you know, and this is another important reason because you want to know if something, some maintenance need doing, you know, you want your properties in good order. So that's another really good re reason for doing these midterm inspections. And it's it's also thinking of the end game because if you've got that maintenance going on, you're noticing cleaning issues during this, you can sort of pick up on this sort of during the tenancy rather than waiting to the end. Um, when we go around, we'll always make sure the isolator switches are, are still on. So many times in bathrooms, they're turned off, we switch them on. Um, and, um, you know, and we always uh, recommend advising the tenant of a follow up visit in one to two weeks if necessary, if there's stuff there. Um, and again, we're not there to judge their lifestyle, just making sure that there's nothing detrimental affecting the property. Can we go on to the next one, please? Um, and then say you're at a checkout and um, you're going to take your need to go to dispute um, on fair wear and tear versus damage. Um, so um, this is what the House of Lords defines as fair wear and tear, the reasonable use of the premise, premises by the tenant and ordinary operation of natural forces. So that won't include any decorations, fixtures and fittings, um, and, it will and it takes into account stuff that would naturally deteriorate over a reasonable amount of time. They also take into fair wear and tear the type and term of tenancy. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, you know, uh, what they'll be looking at is the original conditions. So they'll be looking at the original condition at the inventory stage, um, the quality of the items, the length of the tenancy and the number of tenants. So, you know, for example, say you've got a three bed semi rented out to a professional couple for a year, but there's heavy track duty marks in the hall, in the entrance hall. And, um, you know, after a year, that would really be deemed as excessive fair wear and tear. But if you had a family with three young children in there, that would not be deemed as fair wear and tear. So there are all those things to take into consideration when you're looking at that. My, my theory is, I think if I lived there with that many people, would it would it look like this? I think it's best to form a judgment on your own standards, really. Uh, can we do the next one, please? Um, and then how do you determine a fair deduction? Um, I've got a little calculation here that the um, dispute services will um, that the sorry, not dispute services that the um, adjudicators take into account into account. This is how they calculate it, because when we come to do the checkout at the end, we br bring up the inventory and um, and we compare everything at the end of the tenancy to the beginning of the tenancy. And um, and we actually assign blame. So we would say whether it is a maintenance issue, a tenant issue, you know, or information only. Um, so um, so it's there in black and white. And nine times out of ten, a tenant will read our checkout report at the end and will totally agree because they've got the written word and the photo. Um, and all of our photos as well are di uh, date stamped and timed and embedded into your report. Um, on the paper email report, they don't look that sort of high res, but we can always gain access to the high res 
photos if you need to scrutinise them a bit more, you know, to see a crack in a mirror or something like that. So, um, so the 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 uh, deposit schemes will say like carpets, average property five years, carpets and decor in student properties they they calculate one to two years. Um, as you're probably all aware, you can't have betterment. They do this calculation on depreciation, which if we go on to the next slide, it will show you how they work, how the adjudicators would work it out. Oh, so it's not this slide, it's the next one, but we'll come to it. Um, so dirt is never considered fair wear and tear. That's a cleanliness issue. Damage um, is not fair wear and tear. That is damage. So that is a separate issue. Um, now varnish spills, iron burn marks, um, that will be negligence that is chargeable. Um, and you've got to see whether it's been worn out, been neglected or damaged deliberately, you know, so um, you've got to make a judgment call on that. So I think if we go on to the next slide, um, this is the calculation I was telling you about, got a bit ahead of myself. So, um, so on here, um, I'll read it out verbatim because um, I'm not very good at um, explaining this calculation. So we're going to imagine we've got a carpet that is damaged, uh, that is so severe that it's going to affect the achievable rent for the next tenancy. So an adjudicator will determine a reasonable replacement value. So the cost of a similar replacement carpet is going to be £500. B, the actual age of the carpet is five years. C is the lifespan of the carpet, which should be 10 years. So the residual lifespan left is your C minus B. So that's going to give us five years left remaining. The depreciation of value calculated as A divided by C. So the cost of the carpet um, divided by the average lifespan is giving us £50 a year. So where this carpet has got five years left, the reasonable apportionment that cost to the tenant would come in at £250. And you can all use that calculation to, um, to everything there. Even though recently we had um, uh, an adjudicator went through um, one of our reports that had five cigarette burns, um, and they only awarded the landlord £35, which I think is absolutely shocking, you know. So, but again, it's all that education to your tenants during the tenancy when you're doing your property visits or your midterm inspections. Um, should we do the next slide, please? So, um, I hope everyone's kept up with that. Um, so in summary, you know, at the beginning, a good detailed inventory, um, you know, third party inventories are really good for you because we are only there to say what we see. We're not there on the side of the tenant or the landlord. We're there to just produce this unbiased report. Um, remember the importance of condition and cleanliness, good quality photographs that are date stamped, timed and embedded within the report at the actual time we're doing the inventory. Um, really good shout to do an accompanied check-in. Um, really good um, to make sure that your um, tenant signs for the inventory. Um, we do have a bit of software that um, we can send your, um, send your um, tenant the inventory on the day they move it, on the day they move in. And our back office system will send them three reminders to say if we don't receive it by seven days signed, we're going to deem it as acceptable. And then because we send out three reminders during that week, sort of every two days, if they don't sign it and it goes to dispute, you've actually got a proven audit trail behind you to give to the adjudicators. Um, your regular property visits, I can't stress that enough. And then just be reasonable, you know, when you're calculating deductions. And if you've got a good, clearly written checkout report that's got the inventory there, the checkout word in there, you know, they really can't say, no, that isn't like that. You know, that iron burn mark was not in the original inventory 
but it is at the end. You're the only people living there and um, they can't deny that. If we go on to the next one. Um, so, you know, obviously as landlords, we must all ensure that we comply with all the relevant legislation. Um, the inventory is a good process for evidencing all the dilapidations at the end. Um, you're all, we've got a full audit trail for everything that we do. Um, and we are the NRLA's recommended inventory provider on their website. Um, and we can even offer new landlords a 15% discount joining fee. And any on NRLA landlords do get a discounted service, you know, from the reports that we provide. So um, if we go to the next one. And I'll now say, has anybody got any questions? And I'm going to get Rob to answer them. That's very, <laughs> very, that's very cute of you, Nikki. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you for providing that thorough explanation of your services. And uh, I obviously appreciate it's um, Rob that runs the franchise in the King's Lynn. Have we got any questions for Rob um, from anybody? <clears throat> I have a little question, if that's OK. Um, mm. So, Rob, how does your service differ from one that, say, a letting agent would provide a landlord within um, their, their full package, if you like? Uh, I won't discuss costs with letting agents, because that's probably not fair. Um, I think the main difference is because we are independent, because ultimately um, a letting agent is going to be working for um, their landlord client um, and full independence. Um, is always going to be better with, with your yeah. duties. I mean, I, I used to be um, a letting agent myself for over 10 years uh, yeah. for my own organisation. So, yeah, I'm fully aware that uh, landlords can lean on on, on their letting agents, um, you know, sort of say, yeah, can we have this in there? Can we have that in there? Um, which may, may or may not be reasonable, depending on circumstance. But from an adjudicator point of view, if you've got a professional independent company doing the inventory, then there's just nothing to fall back on. So and you tend to work. Must, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, Nikki. I was just going to add to that, Joe. That um, a lot of the letting agents are actually our clients, and they do outsource um, so, so that they've got that independence. <clears throat> you know. Oh, okay. So it yeah. is some landlords can check whether that agent does outsource it or does it in house. Okay. Yeah, I won't. I won't name names in this forum, but I mean, we we have large agencies within Kings Lynn, Wisbeach, Boston, Spalding, um, yeah. Peterborough that use us on, on almost oh, a good. day to actually do reports for them. So oh, that's really good. It's not purely private landlords. That's something we additionally do. Yeah, but you do work with landlords who manage properties themselves as Absolutely, well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well. Perfect. Well, it sounds it sounds like a really thorough. Um, process and I mean I've worked in housing for too many years now and I remember the days when I would have landlords come to me and you know say all the things that have gone wrong at the end of a tenancy um, you know and I you know set out a number of things and one of those was you know to make sure that you have a thorough inventory at the beginning um, so that you've got evidence as to how the property was when they moved in and I can't you know uh, impress that enough on, on landlords when we even when we speak to them now in the job we're doing now so yeah, it's really, really um, important. And thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sure our landlords will find that useful. Um, yeah. So thank you. Um, any questions? Any questions before we move on? No? Lovely. OK, thank you very much, um, Nikki and Rob. Um, so we're now going to move on to Sarah. Um, Sarah is a colleague from um, Anglia Revenue Partnership um, who run the council's um, council tax and benefit system. Um, and Sarah's kindly agreed to um, uh, inform landlords about the discretionary housing payment um, that is available from Fenland um, and how landlords may benefit from knowing what it's all about. So I'm going to hand um, you over to Sarah now. Um, and if you could put the slides up, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Andy, could you just go straight on to the next slide? So, yeah, I'm Sarah Hyman and I'm from Anglia Revenues Partnership. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Anglia Revenues Partnership, we're a um, collection of, well, we're, we provide revenues and benefits services. Uh, so like Jay mentioned, council tax, that encompasses things like council tax, non-domestic non rates, 
housing benefit, um, local council tax reduction and discretionary housing payment. Um, and we provide those services for five local authorities across East Anglia, which is Breckland, East Cambridgeshire, uh, East Suffolk, Fenland um, and West Suffolk Council. So on to the next slide, please, Andy. So, yeah, I was just going to talk to you a little bit about discretionary housing payments. So DHPs is a fund given to us, given to each local authority every year by DWP. It's a fund that are for people that are in receipt of universal credit, um, including the housing element or housing benefit. And we use the fund in very general terms to alleviate poverty and prevent homelessness. What we look at, um, and this is the guide given to us by DWP, is to, you know, the, the general guide to help us make sure that we're targeting the right households to help with DHP. And that is households that are um, need further financial assistance towards their housing costs. When we answer, when we look at whether they need that further financial assistance towards their housing costs, what we look at is whether they've got a rent shortfall um, or they need help with their rent in advance or deposit or moving costs. Um, housing costs isn't defined in law, but in, in general terms, that's what we consider to be a housing cost um, that we could consider for helping with DHP. And when we say those that need further financial assistance with those housing costs, what we're looking at um, is someone that's in financial hardship. So we say, OK, they've they've got housing costs. They need help with housing costs because they're in financial hardship to determine if they're in financial hardship. Um, in very general terms, we look at everything they've got coming in um, and everything that they're spending. And if they overspend, we consider them to be in financial hardship. That is tweaked um, to you know, making sure that we pay attention to what's going on. So, um, for example, uh, everyone's suffering with the cost of living crisis at the moment, and we do pay attention to everything that everyone tells us that they've got, that they're spending. And we bear in mind that there, you know, there are additional costs that maybe they haven't um, included when they've applied, or something, an annual cost that they haven't included, or they're not aware that their bills have gone up and they're perhaps putting a low amount for food. Um, and we do we sort of allow a certain amount of overspend before we say, OK, you do have money left over. To um, receive DHP, someone um, has to apply for it um, and those applications should be made online. Someone can receive support to apply for DHP um, and that support can be provided by their landlord, a friend or a relative. Um, citizens advice or someone like that. Um, if support is unavailable, um, and, you know, and they can't get help from their friend or um, citizens advice, then we can support them to apply um, via a telephone claim. Um, so if they contact us, we can call them back and arrange an appointment to do that application with them over the phone. So. We encourage people to seek support to apply if they need it. Um, but however, you must bear in mind that if you are supporting someone to apply for DHP, that it is their application and they must be part of that process um, to apply. So there is a declaration area of the form towards the end and they must agree to those statements um, before the form is submitted. OK, um, next slide, please, Andy. OK, so I briefly touched on the types of awards, so what we consider to be the housing costs that someone might need help with. Um, and the first off, it's a rent shortfall, and that is the bread and butter of DHP, really. That's the traditional DHP. And what we're looking at is, do they need help with um, topping up the benefits that they receive via housing benefit or universal credit with housing element um, to afford their actual rent? It's really easy to look at rent shortfalls um, in housing benefit cases because the housing benefit is a weekly award and you compare that to the actual rent. And the difference there we consider to be the housing cost that they might need help with on an, you know, on an ongoing basis um, to prevent them accruing rent arrears. 
For universal credit cases, we can award, we can help with rent shortfalls and we are um, keen to promote DHP for these kinds of cases, but we appreciate it's really difficult to determine what is actually a rent shortfall when it comes to universal credit cases. So if you're not too familiar with how universal credit works, um, to assess universal credit, you look at, uh, the DWP will look at um, a maximum UC award. So they'll tot up all these different elements that fit that particular household. And then um, there'll be a taper off the maximum award. So how much that taper, and the taper will be because they might have some earned income or unearned income, another benefit that needs to be brought into that means tested calculation. So when that tapers off the maximum universal credit award, it's very difficult to know how much of that is actually reducing the rent with the amount of housing element. So how much of that deduction it should be considered a housing cost need? So how much of that is actually a rent shortfall? Now, uh, in terms of assessment for our team, we've got lots of tools available to help us do that, to determine what would they would have received had they been in receipt of housing benefit. What's a fair shortfall? So we've we've got experience in looking at that, but I appreciate those that are working with people, your tenants, um, it's going to be difficult to know what that rent shortfall is, even if the housing element is paid direct. Now, that's because I think you know, the, the misconception before was that if the universal credit housing element amount was the same as the actual rent, well, there can't be a rent shortfall, but actually there can because of that taper that I mentioned. So things to look out for that might constitute a rent shortfall in a universal credit claimants um, case would be um, LHA restrictions. So if their rent is um, higher than the LHA amount, if they've got, if they're affected by the benefits cap, not, not necessarily relevant to you guys, but if they're affected by spare room subsidy, um, that 25% or 14% reduction in the um, social rented sector. Housing cost contribution, which is your old non-dependent deduction, um, but it's called housing cost, cost contribution in universal credit, um, or a reduction for, um, uh, unearned income or earned income or something like that. Rent in advance or deposit. So we do get cases where we can help um, someone with their rent in advance or deposit. This would be what we'd be looking at is whether they're moving to a property that is more suitable or affordable for them. So we want to see that they're, they're likely to be able to manage the shortfall when they move if there is going to be a shortfall. So I'm not saying that the rent has to be below LHA rates, but we would expect to see that they can afford it if it is slightly above LHA rates. And we want to know that by helping with DHP, um, it's removing that barrier to them being able to move into more affordable accommodation. So if they're um, currently in receipt of DHP for that rent shortfall, because the rent is much higher than their actual benefit award, um, and they, it's the opportunity to move to a property that's more affordable, but they can't move because they don't have access to that capital. So they don't have the amount of money that is needed to pay that rent in advance or deposit. Then we would be look, actively looking to help with the DHP for that rather than continuing to support them in a property they can't afford. And that's the same with moving costs. If those, if moving costs are presenting a barrier to them being able to move to a property that they um, is more suitable or affordable to them, for them, then we'd want to help with the DHP too. Now I've put rent arrears on here um, because we can help with rent arrears. And I think over the last few years, it's been DHP has been considered one of those things that is a tool to help with rent arrears. But what we want to do is, is aim to stop it being considered when arrears have accrued and rather use DHP to prevent those arrears accruing in the first place. And I appreciate that is difficult because most people that would benefit those people that would benefit most from a DHP are the ones that are least likely to engage with us and are very hard to get them to apply and sort of um, see the assessment process through. But we so we can help with rent arrears, but please bear in mind that um, it's very restrictive. So for us, we can't help where those arrears have accrued during periods of time that they weren't in receipt of housing benefit or the housing element of universal credit. And similarly, had they been in receipt of those benefits, 
but didn't pay their rent to their landlord, we can't just simply offset it with a DHP because that is duplication of housing costs. OK, can I have the next slide, please, Andy? Um, some things aren't eligible for a DHP, and I think that these are the things that you would expect to see. So um, ineligible service charges, sanctions and reductions in benefit, shortfalls caused by repayment of housing benefit or universal credit overpayment recovery, um, increases in rent due to outstanding rent arrears. We don't often see that, but we can't just simply pay the difference. We can't consider it a shortfall if it's simply increased just to um, recoup rent arrears that are outstanding. Uh, benefit suspensions and those that are the, those two rent arrears um, cases that I just highlighted before. You know, we can't duplicate housing costs where um, the rent arrears had the rent arrears have accrued when they were actually in receipt of housing benefit or universal credit and didn't pay their landlord. Not to say that we can't consider any shortfall that would have existed at that time. Um, but it, we are restricted. We can't just simply award that what they've already received in statutory benefit. And also if they weren't in receipt of housing benefit or universal credit at the time the arrears accrued, we can't help with that. Next slide, please, Andy. I th I've included this slide because I think it's really useful just to see what it is that the assessors are looking for when someone applies for that additional help. Um, so with some, when someone applies for DHP, we look at um, all those things that I've mentioned there, plus others, but these are these are the most common things that we're looking at. You know, how were the rears crude? Um, is there a reason that they need to move? So if the property is like for like, if the rent is exactly the same, so it's not essentially um, saving them money, so it doesn't, it's not more affordable, but is it more suitable? So are they moving closer to the school um, that their children go to and they don't have access to public transport? Are they looking to move into work and they um, live in a rural area? So they want to move into a town um, because then they'll be able to access work. They're more likely to be able to um, access public transport links and things like that. Has their property been adapted for to meet their disabled needs? So it's um, inappropriate to expect them to move. So is there a reason that we want to help them stay in their current pro current property? And we look at if we're going to award DHP, what's going to change? You know, how's that going to impact on their situation? Lots of times we're looking at um, what's going to change in the future. So how long should we be considering DHP for? So, so it could be something like um, you have a couple living in a property and it's a two bedroom property. So under LHA, they're only given the one bedroom rate, but they're expecting a baby um, in six months time, four months time, something like that. You know that they go, their benefits are going to increase in four months time um six months time or however long it is for that change then you'd be looking at dhp for that period of time to bridge the gap we'd be asking questions like is it reasonable to expect them to make changes when this change is going to happen anyway so we're looking at what we can do to help for the period of time that they need it if there's no clear change um we would be looking at a short term award um, of somewhere between 13 and 26 weeks. Sometimes we will award it for less um, and that will be UC cases because there is uncertainty when someone's in receipt of housing benefit. Our discretionary housing payment award tracks it on the system. So any changes to housing benefit will automatically change the discretionary housing payment. If, ha if, if housing benefit goes up, DHP will reduce because it, it won't exceed their actual rent. When they're in receipt of universal credit, we're not, our, the two systems aren't connected. So um, we have to award for shorter periods so that we can keep an eye on it. Each case is assessed on its own merits though. Um, and some cases we will award for a longer period of time. And that's where we think that it's unlikely there's unlikely to be a change and it's not reasonable to expect there to be a change. So that's an adaptation to the property, as I've mentioned before. Um, and also something like you've got a separated family um, and the only the one, only the person with the main residence for the children would receive the, the appropriate amount in their benefits. And the other person, you know, the separated partner 
wouldn't receive that within their benefits award. So therefore, we'd look at topping up with a DHP and looking at how reasonable, um, how long a period of time that would be needed for, but it wouldn't necessarily be a short term award. All right, next slide, please. Uh, just to just to touch on extensions and reconsiderations. So um, every time we award DHP, and in fact, if we were to, if there was an unsuccessful application for DHP, we always give advice as to what someone can do to help better their situation. So we'll always be saying things like, you know, if they have debts or any non-essential expenditure or something like that that we think maybe needs addressing, we will. Um, advise them that we would expect them to go visit Citizens Advice or another organisation that's available to help them with that. Um, and also we might say, you know, you need to contact the housing team if we don't contact the housing team um, to say that you need to be looking at more appropriate accommodation. If um, they ask for an extension, which can happen, you know, as I mentioned, we do award for a short period of time in some cases then they can ask for an extension and we just want to see that they'd followed the advice that we'd given them. So if we said you've got high um, expenditure on debts, you perhaps need to look at consolidating those or speaking to an expert in that field, we suggest you talk to Citizens Advice. If they ask for an extension, we'd expect to see that they had followed that advice before we extended the DHP award. And reconsideration requests, there is no right of appeal, um, but you that a claimant can ask for us to reconsider the decision um, and they should just be made in writing uh, and this can be via email but I would advise them always to include additional support and also sort of to be mindful um, of the income and expenses they've told us about because we do ask um, some quite thorough questions as part of the online application process but we do get cases where people are um, don't necessarily tell us everything that they are spending. And we do try and bear that in mind. But if we've um, said no to a DHP or not extended it because they haven't followed our advice, it is it would be worth them looking at all the income and expenses that they included and just making sure that they are honest and they do look at any annual costs and things that they incur that they maybe didn't tell us about on their first application. Next slide, please, Andy. OK, I thought I'd just sort of run through an example case with you so you can just sort of see um, the kinds of times that someone might benefit from help via a DHP and where you, you know, um, where possibly you could raise awareness of DHP for us and help any of your tenants that are suffering with a rent shortfall. So if you've got, we've got a universal credit um, household, a family with three children living in the private rented sector. Uh, their Universal Credit Award was just under uh, £1,500 a month and, and of that their housing element was um, £577 a month. This family was affected by the benefit cap um, and their overall Universal Credit was reduced by £358 a month. We looked at all their income and expenses um, and it showed that they had a massive overspend of £312 a week. That is quite large um, compared to other cases we see, but it's not unheard of. There have been you know, a few that I've seen in my time that have had massive overspends like that. Their rent is £323 a week, which is quite high um, compared to other cases we see. So the things that we were bearing in mind when assessing this case was one of the children was currently undertaking their GCSEs um, and an additional bedroom would be granted at some stage in the future, but not for, for not for a little while. So we were saying, OK, well, the rent is extremely high, uh, but the claimant was considering moving, was happy to considering moving. But at the, the at this stage, um, they didn't want to disrupt their son's education um, because of the fact that he was currently undertaking his GCSEs. So although, you know, the benefit's going to increase um, once they get the additional bedroom. However, that rent was so extremely high that that wasn't really going to reduce that rent shortfall or help them financially. So something else has to happen. And that our advice to them is you really do need to seek alternative accommodation that is within your budget. 
but we appreciate now is not the time to do that. So therefore we awarded DHP for 18 weeks at £115 a week to help them um, and also ask them to sort of actively look into the alternative accommodation that's available. At the end of that 18 weeks, if they had followed that advice and they are still looking into accommodation, but they hadn't yet found it, they can ask for an extension. All right, now, next slide, please. Thanks, Andy. Um, so just a few things that I wanted to add is that we do have we do have uh, leaflets and posters for DHP and the, the leaflet that we have is just currently being updated to include a QR code. Um, just to try and um, make it a little bit easier to get online and apply. So if you could include that in any literature you have with tenants, any sort of packs that you put together at the beginning of a tenancy, then that would be really useful for us. And I can share a PDF with you when, when, um, when it's complete, when the QR codes have all been added. Um, and promotions and projects. So this year, we're coming to the end of this financial year, so we're not really doing anything at the moment, but we always do if we have got, um, you know, money left in the pot or we haven't had as many applications or we know that there's more people that would be benefit from a DHP that perhaps they haven't applied or aren't aware of DHP. We will use social media. Um, we have done direct mail shots in the past, but we are losing contact with our customer base because of people moving over to Universal Credit. So we are working closely with our job centres to make sure that they raise awareness of DHP for us. We think that it's a perfect opportunity because everyone that applies for Universal Credit does meet with a work coach or most people will meet with a work coach. And that face to face conversation would be a perfect opportunity to talk about DHP if someone mentions that they're struggling with their rent or the housing element, they know the housing element is going to be less than their rent, then the work coach can talk about DHP there. So we do provide them with leaflets and ask them to actively encourage people to apply for DHP. Next slide, please. Any questions? Oh, that's Lovely, Sarah. Thank you very much. That was a very thorough explanation of DHP. Um, I, I hope landlords have got a, a, the gist of um, what that is now. Um, I mean, it is um, at the moment, obviously, with the uh, cost of living crisis, it's really more important that we do try to understand uh, which of our um, residents um, you know, should be referred for further advice with regards to financial difficulties. Um, and I'm sure DHP would be uh, beneficial to some. Um, I can't see any hands raised. Um, but I do have a question myself, um, and is that is does the breakdown of their universal credit show um, how much their housing element is? So if a land landlord was to look at communication from um, uh, the DWP about their UC, would it have on there how much the housing element was so that they could see whether there was a shortfall to their rent? Yes, they could. But like I said, it's not always clear cut that that would be a shortfall. So you can see that the housing element is, yes, you can see it on the journal. So when someone is in receipt of universal credit, they have an online journal and it will tell them what amount is for housing costs. But like I said, that that that's essentially telling you in old money what their maximum housing benefit would have been. So yeah. it, you, it, you have to bear in mind any further deductions off that. So it could be that the housing element covers the rent entirely, but they've got a benefit cap and that is a does, short does it, does it explain anywhere that there's a benefit cap or I'm anything not, on the communications? I think, I believe it does, but I'm not 100%. I know that it does mention about the housing costs. Um, but yeah, it's the idea of universal credit is that it's just one payment that encompasses everything and it's for them to manage it. Um, but for us, for this side of things, we want to make sure that we're helping if someone can't afford their rent. So what I yeah. would say to landlords is just if someone's in receipt of universal credit and they're saying that they can't manage their rent um, and they're working a little bit, then absolutely we could, you know, there's potential for a DHP there. It's worth mm -hmm. just raising awareness of it with everyone. And I asked for it to be included in sort of tenancy packs because I think, you know, someone's circumstances can change. Yeah. Um, and universal credit does replace working tax credit and child tax credit. So a lot more people will be applying for that. Um, yeah. 
than maybe you would have seen with housing benefit and it's sort of hidden within there. Yeah, um, OK, thank you. And we've got Denai as well, um, who wants to ask a question. Thank you, Denai. Oh, I think you're on mute. Hold on. Let me just. Bear with me. There you go, Denai, sorry. Oh, I still can't um, hear you. Oh, there, yeah, you there go. we are. Yeah. Two <laughs> double muted. My children would love it. Um, it's just a quickie. Relationship breakdowns in joint tenancies where one person is then left in the property, but there's been a significant drop in the income coming into that property. Is that potentially um, some something that they could be signposted towards a DHP claim potentially? Yeah, absolutely. I would say if they're in receipt of universal credit to speak to the job centre first or alongside an application for DHP because it's it's possibly that they're not considering the full rent and they should it's called an untidy tenancy um <laughs> but the bonus of a DHP is which I didn't mention in my presentation actually is one thing that we will always do is look to maximize their benefits before we award a DHP so um it, it will look at if the benefits is are correct from our point of view and um we'll look to get those maximised before topping up with a DHP. So things like untidy tenancies, because the other half of the rent isn't covered because the partner left, we'll yeah. say, we'll, we'll drop an email to DWP and say, we think this is an untidy tenancy. And we'll also tell the tenant, we think that you need to pop this on your journal, get this looked at, and then we'll look at this portion, you know, because it could be even with the top up, you know, the full housing element, there could be a shortfall there. So um, we'll consider that part with DHP. And if they're on a low income, again, that yeah. maximising benefits could help. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Sarah? No, I can't see any more hands. OK, thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Um, well done. No worries. Thank you. Um, and Denai, you might as well keep that um, microphone off because it's very poignant. We're coming to you next. Um, yeah. Denai, Denai, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce yourself because I know that you've got a little fabulous spiel for us um, <laughs> <laughs> and you need no introduction. <laughs> okay. Over to you. So, good evening, everybody, and thank you for your patience tonight. I am Danai Evans and I'm the Safe Accommodation Programme Manager for the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough IDVA service. Um, and our service offers support to all those experiencing domestic abuse across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And by the way, IDVA stands for Independent Domestic Violence Advocate. We seem to enjoy big job titles in our roles. So in my role, I'm specifically responsible for delivering Cambridgeshire County Council's safe accommodation strategy. And that was brought in by Tier 1 local authorities, uh, following the Domestic Abuse Act 2021. So there is a now a legal duty for all tier one local authorities to have a safe accommodation strategy in regards to domestic abuse. And we deliver it in support of, with tier two local authorities such as Fenland District Council and other domestic organisations, domestic abuse organisations in the region. The safe accommodation strategy needs to and should cover all types of tenure and accommodation where domestic abuse can occur and what support can be offered to those experiencing uh, domestic abuse. And the government was particularly keen on ensuring that awareness was raised within the private sector, uh, both for tenants and for landlords. Next slide, please. So. What is domestic abuse? The uh, On the slide, this is the government and legal definition for what is domestic abuse. Um, I prefer to use the term domestic abuse rather than domestic violence because domestic abuse is not just violence. Uh, it's not just punching, kicking, spitting, hitting. It can be um, other types of abuse. And certainly the Domestic Abuse Act 2021 raised the profile of controlling and coercive behaviour. And that abuse 
quite often doesn't show itself in the terms of bruises or any sort of harms, uh, but can be particularly damaging to those people who are experiencing it. And it is now laid out in legislation. Next slide, please. So who can experiencing, who can experience domestic abuse? On the slide here are some of the statistics just about the prevalence of domestic abuse uh, across England and Wales. Um, and as you can see, 2.4 million adults a year experienced in domestic abuse and 17 percent, which is a huge percentage really of all offences reported to the police are domestic abuse related. Domestic abuse can, can be experienced by anyone. And I'm mindful that there may be people attending this forum who are aware of family members, friends, colleagues who have experienced it domestic abuse or had knowledge of it. And certainly I hope if anyone sitting here has had a direct experience of domestic abuse, that the slides aren't triggering. And if after this talk you want to get my email and come back for some confidential information around the support available, I'm, I'm happy to provide it. Arguably, domestic abuse is a gendered crime, which basically means that more women experience it than men. But certainly our service provides support to male victims of domestic abuse as much as female. And also there are quite a few support services out there now for men experiencing domestic abuse as well. Next slide, please. Who can experience domestic abuse? Really, anybody. Anybody over the age of 16, under 16, abuse is classed as child abuse and abuse can be from an intimate partner, an ex-intimate partner, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend. It can be from a family member, brother, sister, uh, adult child. And sadly, recent domestic homicide reviews, which is when there is a death, a murder that is directly linked to domestic abuse, have actually been adult children murdering their parent. For our service, we take referrals largely from the police and from other professional organisations. But currently we have clients whose ages range from 16 to I think 82 is our oldest client at the moment. As I said, we support male clients and we also support clients regardless of their tenure, private sector, owner occupiers, social housing, rough sleepers. And we also support clients regardless of their kind of economic status. We have clients who own their own businesses just as much as we have clients who have no recourse to public funds or or even work illegally. The next slide, please. So domestic abuse in the private rented sector, you know, I think you guys sitting here are all aware of the importance of the private rented sector, particularly in this region, in the eastern region. There's a massive, you know, there's a high housing need, an increasing shortage of social housing. And I think private landlords and, and private tenancies are being used increasingly as a way to solve a housing crisis and housing need. It may well be that some of you here at this forum already link up with your housing teams, assisting them with helping tenants in housing need find accommodation. And I think one of the stats that's interesting on this slide is that in actual fact, more households with children now live in the private rented sector than they do in social housing. The part of the slide that I've put in bold, again, relates back to the safe accommodation strategy and following the domestic abuse bill, which was there was a feeling that in a coordinated community response to domestic abuse, which is making sure that everybody involved with the person experiencing it is aware that it's happening. 
police, education, health, A&E departments, etc. It was felt that quite often the private sector was not included in that response or not considered. And I think that is something that we very much want to change. And again, though it's a dark subject to come to, and it is the extreme of domestic abuse, I know that in the Fenland area, there was a, a DHR that, that did occur in a HMO, a private rented sector. And I think uh, Fenland's Community Safety Partnership responded to that by trying to ensure that particularly its migrant outreach workers were linking up with HMOs. And again, looking to inform people about the support available out there uh, to those experiencing domestic abuse. The next slide, please. Private landlords and their agents, you can often be the first people to know that domestic abuse is occurring in a property or to a person. It may be because your tenant has told you directly. It could be because there's been a relationship breakdown. They want to change that tenancy. But they may also not quite know how to express that. And again, a lot of people who experience domestic abuse, English isn't necessarily their first language. And also sometimes the terminology that professionals like myself or others might use about domestic abuse is not familiar to people. So, for example, they might suddenly tell you that they don't feel safe in their home anymore or they want to leave that accommodation. Quite often, and in my previous life, I was a housing officer for a a social landlord for many years, and I also worked in the ASB team, we got a lot of reports about domestic abuse from neighbours. And quite often they'd be reporting it as antisocial behaviour, shouting, screaming, you know, arguments on the street. There are also maybe other things that, and again, in this presentations that I've been listening to, you know, inspections of properties, one of the ones that I saw really routinely as housing officer was damage to internal doors, damage to external windows. Quite often the little windows by the doors, the front and back doors, as someone tried to access the property or get to the locks. And you may also have professionals contact you. I think particularly the police ask you to do lock changes and things like that. And, and you are then made aware that domestic abuse is, is occurring with your tenants in your property. So if I move on to the next slide, please. So how can the private rented sector help? I think these are the four points, really. Identify the signs, respond safely and helpfully, signpost to local services and offer some, if you can, housing specific support and solutions. Uh, another avenue you can go down, and I think these landlord forums are excellent, is speaking to your local housing team that you link up with, you know, and they can then put you in touch or give you information about the services available in your area. So I'm just going to go through some short slides with some ideas and suggestions. Next slide, please. So identify asking your tenants about domestic abuse. And I should say right from the outset, in this slide, I use the term should. If you believe your tenant may be experiencing domestic abuse, you should ask them about the situation. Nothing compels you to. Nothing legally compels you to. You know, arguably nothing makes you ask those questions. But I do think as a landlord uh, or as a letting agent, the more you know about what's happening in your property, the better prepared you are, both for support, but also potential tenancy changes or, or issues going on in that house. It is, however, very important that if you are speaking to anybody, a tenant about domestic abuse, you know that they're on their own and you're confident that speaking to them is not going to put them at further risk. And also, just like it's up to you whether you ask those questions, it is up to your tenant whether they choose to, to tell you about domestic abuse. I certainly think there are scenarios where it's better that tenants do. For example, if they're accruing rent arrears or if there's been damage to the property that they didn't cause. 
And again, some people will just not talk, tell you about domestic abuse. There is still a huge amount of shame, you know, a huge amount of fear and a huge amount of misunderstanding of what might happen to a person or their children if they tell people that they're experiencing domestic abuse. And we particularly see that in perhaps tenants who have not necessarily grown up in the UK. The countries they come from may have very different attitudes and legislation around domestic abuse. And also, it may be as fundamental as they're not confident with how they could express that domestic abuse to somebody in English. Like any kind of thing, when you're asking questions, open questions, what can I do? How can I help? Is the best approach. But if a tenant does disguise domestic abuse to you, you've got to be ready. Could I have the next slide, please? You need to be ready to respond. Firstly, it's important that you believe them. Domestic abuse, part of its key part of it, how it how it carries on, how it maintains is by silence, is by people being disbelieved and the person experiencing dis domestic abuse feeling that they won't be believed and quite often their perpetrator has convinced them of that. You need to listen without any blame. You don't question why they haven't left the perpetrator. You don't kind of give them advice like you must leave him, you must do that or you must leave them. You need to validate what they're telling you. Thank you for telling me. I appreciate that's difficult being that open and honest with me. And really important is to tell them what you're going to do now that they've told you. Or more importantly as well, what you can't do. You know, for example, changing locks is not always that simple. Letting them just leave the property is not always that simple. Being able to ring the police on their behalf, that might not be what you can do. But you could perhaps reassure them and say, I'm going to make a note on our file. I will not tell the other person what you have told me. I will arrange for locks to be changed. Or conversely, I'm sorry I can't and this is the reason. Next slide, please. And some other things, once you've had a response or someone has told you about domestic abuse, do not confront the abuser. Do not confront the perpetrator. Even if it's perhaps someone you've had as a tenant for a long period of time and you think you have a reasonable relationship, you know, talking to the perpetrator can significantly increase risk to uh, the person experiencing the, the abuse. Don't contact the police or specialist services without the tenant's consent. Um, unless, of course, there's an immediate significant risk of harm to that person or their children. You need to be aware that if you do report concerns to agencies such as social services or the police, they may just not tell you anything more, not tell you what happens with that report, or they may even push back a little bit and even talking to you at all. And regarding children specifically, because children are victims of domestic abuse, uh, you can report urgent safeguarding concerns to your local social services. That's the term I use. And again, consent is prefer preferred, but if it's an urgent, significant risk of harm, then it is better, I feel, to refer, to make that call, to seek advice rather than to do nothing. So moving on to the next slide and ways that landlords and lettings agents can help. So the obvious one, if it's an emergency, if a tenant is, is calling you midst an incident, advise them to call 999. The police are the people who respond in an emergency. If you are able to explain to them that there is a service, the silent solution system, where you can call the police without needing to speak and you call 999, press 555, that call is registered as an emergency call, but nothing else needs to be said. But if your tenant or their children is at risk of imminent harm and you believe that is occurring as you are speaking to them and are aware, 
end that call and you call 999 and ask for a police to attend your address. The next slide, please. So my next couple of slides talk about what can you do to help if there are children in the property. It is obvious, I feel, that domestic abuse profoundly affects children who witness the abuse. They can be directly harmed by the perpetrator, but they're also growing up in an environment of violence, fear and intimidation. If you know that there's domestic abuse occurring in the property or you're concerned about what the children might be witnessing, you can try and talk to the tenant yourself. Again, be mindful of safety, the tenants and the children's. And again, no discussion with the person who is believed is causing harm to that children because there is again that increased risk to that child or to their other parent. There are rules around contacting certain agencies about making raising concerns around children. And I would suggest that you seek advice uh, before making a safeguarding referral if you can. The next slide, please. Again, all the way through this, as, as private landlords and lettings agents, you don't have, like those of us who work for the county council or other social providers, you don't have a statutory or legal duty to safeguard children. But the government strongly advises that safeguarding is everybody's business. And I think we all believe that. We know that, that it is better to speak out if you believe a child is at risk of harm than, than say nothing. And also you don't need consent to get advice. OK, and the following slide gives you some ideas of where you can seek advice from. Can I have the following slide, please? So some of these organisations may be familiar to you. NSPCC, Childline, your local safeguarding team, Crime Stoppers even. And of course, again, I'll keep saying it, 999 if there's an immediate risk of harm to that child. If I can move on to the next slide, please. So signposting to specialist services. So as private rented sector landlords or lettings agents, you are not expected to provide specialist information about to tenants experiencing domestic abuse, but you are able to give them information about the professionals and organisations that can. Um, you can find details about your local services on the DASV website and DASV stands for Domestic v Abuse and Sexual Violence. And this website covers the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And again, you can talk to your local housing teams if you've got relationships with them. And one thing that I think landlords could quite easily do and, and let his agents is add the details of the National Domestic Abuse Helpline UK in your tenancy sign up packs. It's it's an agency that's there for anybody experiencing domestic abuse, male, female, young, old, whatever. And I think it's a useful uh, telephone number to provide. And certainly if your tenants are largely tenants where English is not their first language, I'd certainly suggest putting that link in in perhaps a couple of other languages where you think your tenants might be their first language. If we could move to the next slide, please. And I'll try and do these as quickly as possible. So uh, offering specific solutions around the property or the tenancy. So I keep saying it, you don't have to do anything really regarding a disclosure of domestic abuse or support your tenant. But as landlords and lettings agents, you could actually, and probably already are, playing a significant role in supporting victims and their children to feel safe and secure in their current home or potentially help them or advise them about seeking alternative safe accommodation. Next slide, please. Property security. So this is allowing enhanced security measures. Um, phrases used in my world are target hardening and sanctuary schemes. 
and basically there are additional security features on a property to make a tenant feel safe. That can be window locks, it could be a lock change. We also offer tenants specifically things like video ring doorbells, uh, dummy cameras, for example, to enhance security. Obviously, I know from my knowledge of joint tenancies, lock changes can be difficult. Certainly, I don't know what it's like for yourselves, but as a housing officer, I'd routinely get tenants and police and other professionals asking me to change the locks on a joint tenancy. And I would have to explain the legal uh, reasons why I couldn't do that. However, if your tenant has had a court order, then that is something I think you could consider and, and really just gives them immediate sense of security. Our service provides free, um, free provides these security measures free. Um, and we do that in conjunction with a national service called 24 seven locksmiths. Uh, your tenants can also be signposted to this service DAS who offer outreach and tenants can contact them directly themselves. And again, they will ask our service to help with the provision of additional security measures. And we often get the police asking us to do that as well. I do think additional security, you know, just makes a tenant feel safer for a period of time, makes an individual feel safer for a period of time. If we could move on to the next slide. Rent arrears and damage due to domestic abuse. I mean, going back to what I mentioned right at the beginning of my presentation, coercive control, a kind of hidden domestic abuse, but often that control is around finances. It's often about taking rent money. You know, the perpetrator might be spending the rent money on something else while rent arrears are accruing, or they might use the payment of rent and bills as a way to control the person they're abusing. Damage to property. You know, again, it's great if tenants can come to you as soon as damage is occurring, because obviously you want to be made aware of it. But if damage has occurred due to domestic abuse, are you able as a landlord to look at how you can help the tenant make those repayments? And again, I understand that with joint tenancies, tenants are jointly and severally liable. Therefore, the person remaining in that property may be left responsible for rent arrears and damage. I understand that some landlords have looked to consider damage to their property through their insurance, uh, but there may be limitations on that. And certainly I think, you know, as Sarah touched on, if tenants are getting into difficulties around rent, particularly due to domestic abuse, again, signpost them to your housing team or to the CAB to seek help as soon as possible, because there are potentially avenues there that could reduce the rent arrears for the tenant and see you guys getting your full rent. If we can move to the next slide. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I think most of you know the rules around joint tenancies quite clearly. Um, and basically, again, you know, when there is a joint tenancy, perpetrators can't just be removed. They can't have their names just taken off a tenancy. And I think, again, quite often tenants don't understand that. Um, there is a concern sometimes that within joint tenancies, the perpetrator could serve notice on that tenancy to bring it to an end as a yeah. final kind of act of control. Just at the top of your screen. In fact, if I do that on my cursor, you might even be able to see my cursor. Um, whenever this is is my it cursor, too can small? You see that? Just type in the word yes if you can. Yeah. Top word yeah. So you say yes. Great. So that building there is uh, a five black. Shall I carry version. on speaking? I'm sorry, there's yeah. some interference. Okay, sorry somewhere. about that. Oh, sorry, I thought. So. <laughs> So, oh, yeah, I think it is worth speaking to your tenant when they're alone about the possible legal options they may have if they're in a joint tenancy. There are mechanisms that you might your your tenants might tell you about or you may be aware about that legally remove a joint tenant's right to occupy that property, be it permanently or temporarily. Things that we hear in our world and you might hear occupation orders, for example, 
DVPOs, which are issued by the police, domestic violence uh, pr protection orders, but they don't actually affect the tenancy agreement themselves and therefore they don't address that long-term housing issue. Legal options for a tenant could be a transfer of tenancy under the Family Law Act, but I think with private sector tenancies, that's really probably depends on the length of that, that tenancy. And obviously, if your tenants are on a periodic, their joint tenancy, you could discuss with them whether they serve notice, give a four week notice on that periodic tenancy and you agree to issue a sole tenancy to that tenant. But again, being mindful as Sarah's talk earlier, ensuring that tenant can actually afford to take that property on in their sole name. If we could move to the next slide. Alternative accommodation and tenancy ends. Now, I, I think this is quite often particularly difficult in private sector things, but arguably maybe considering whether you could allow a tenant to relinquish that tenancy within a fixed term without any sanctions, particularly if there's an ongoing risk to the tenant and their children. And again, particularly in those cases where those families actually have to flee this area, this region. There are some rules about getting help with rent when you're not living in a property. But as a landlord, you may think actually best just to end this. And the other thing is, if you're a portfolio landlord, you may want to consider whether you have another property away from where the domestic abuse is uh, occurring that you would be willing to move your tenant to um, and end the tenancy where the domestic abuse is experiencing. But again, I am aware that there are some legal limitations around that. And moving on to my final slide, which is to say thank you for listening. I hope I haven't spoken too quickly. There is a lot of information there and I'm hoping to come back again to speak to landlord forums across the region. I'm meeting with Cambridge City's Landlord Steering Group next week and I'm happy to come back to talk to private landlords if there are specific issues and areas around domestic abuse they would like to learn more about. So any questions? And I appreciate I'm really eating into that time, so apologies. No, I don't have to apologise. Thank you so much. You've given such a um, detailed um, uh, insight into the awful world that is domestic abuse. Um, and I don't think any of us sitting here would um, want to will feel comfortable walking away from anything that we see, whether it be in our professional or personal lives. So um, I think you've raised awareness quite succinctly there and thank you very much for that. So thank we you. really appreciate that. Thank um, you very do we much. have do we have any questions from any landlords? Obviously Denise said that she'd be happy to speak about specifics. Obviously it's quite a sensitive subject um, and requires a lot of mm. uh, obviously data protection, etc. So um, if any landlords mm. want to get in touch with Denia can provide um, her details to you later. Absolutely. Any questions? No. OK. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, you Denia. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank. Um, just on to our last um, presentation now, last uh, last presentation of the evening, um, you'll be pleased to know, but uh, I hope Tom will be able to wake you up with his uh, dr drama skills. Um, Tom would like to, um, I think, probably um, ask a few favours of our landlords let me say that we've got um he's going to talk about the ukraine project that we've been involved with the homes for ukraine and i think he's trying to he's going to try and play on your heartstrings as best as he can um with uh, with a call out to our private sector landlords here in fenland so tom i'd like to just hand over to you um to give you a presentation i won't give too much away thank you joe <clears throat> andy on the uh, first slide, please. Um, as Joe said, I'm kind of here um, to ask for private landlords' assistance with the Homes to Ukraine scheme. Um, and just to give a little bit of background and explain how you might be able to help. Um, we're not asking you to lose out financially, but to be supportive and help us overcome some of the barriers that uh, our Ukrainian guests are facing that actually are uh, through no fault of their own and um, have come about because of the situation they've been put in. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Andy? I feel like COVID, what's it? 
Um, so just a brief background. So um, just over the year, we've just had the anniversary. So um, Fenland's welcomed over 100 guests spread across uh, the market towns in the district fairly evenly um, and then a few dots on on the villages there so gives you, gives you an idea of that map um, so the hosts have been of are asked to give a minimum of six months accommodation um, our first guest arrived over 10 months ago um, they're with their second host um, the scheme allows for support to be given to hosts for up to two years, but asking a host to give up their house and their spare rooms and uh, family not being able to come and stay and the things, the knock on effects for two years is a big ask. So there are a few out there that are asking, you know, happy to do it for it for as long as required. There are those that said six months and there are eight, nine months and starting to uh, get. Um, Feeling it, uh, they need to move on to the next stage, which is where we want you to potentially help. And I will go on to that in a second. Um, I've also included the group sizes in there just to give a kind of indication of the kind of things that we're needing in that you'll see that there are 30 lots of single people and therefore. HMOs or or similar are, are, are kind of um, going to be in demand. Then we've got 18 that are two and then what, six threes, two fours and two fives. Um, that's obviously really, really broad stand thing there. Some of those twos will be couples, some will be a mum and a child. Um, uh, quite a lot of these people have, are particularly mothers and children. They're not single parents, but they've been forced into a single parent scenario where their husband has had to remain back in Ukraine um, and not been able to leave. And they've been left with sole care of their children. Um, so, but a year on, and some earlier guests are looking to live independently, but unfortunately they are hitting some barriers. So next slide, please, Andy. And uh, something that we're doing, and I wanted to bring this to your attention, is that in each council tax bill, we are having a flyer go in. And here's a couple of sections and the relevance to you being the fact that um, on there, it's asking you if you are a tenant to ask your landlord's permission. So in theory, if you've got tenants that have potentially spare rooms in the, the accommodation they're renting, they may ask you because this is what they're being told to do if you can give permission. Um, and also um, it's on there as well, aimed at landlords. Are you a landlord? Can you talk to us about potentially renting out a property to um, the Ukrainian families. Um, so this is hopefully going to generate some interest with rematching people that want, to, you know, that have already been here maybe for up to a year and um, but their host wants their house back um, and they're not ready to move to independent living. But also there's quite a few that want to move to independent living. Um, and as the war continues, we continue to get new applications in. There was a little bit of a lull over Christmas, but now it started picking up again. Plus, who knows what's going to happen? It can change on a sixpence. Um, the social housing sector have applied a fairly basic formula to um, whether their guests, whether their sorry tenants can can host, and that is if they it doesn't cause overcrowding, they're not in arrears, and there are no outstanding complaints against the tenant, then they say yes. So if they're a reasonably good tenant, up to date with their rent, and they've got a spare room, not a problem. But the guests in no way form any kind of tenancy agreement or anything that uh, that legally affects um, the existing tenant agreement um, and is um, being designed deliberately that way so that uh, likewise with just people that are hosting those the guests don't have tenants rights in that sense. And doo -doo -doo, I think that's it on that one. Sorry, Andy, next slide. Just quickly glance at my notes. So just to give you an example of a, let's give you a positive. So a family of five that were arrived at the beginning of May um, and they were staying with a family. I'm sure anyone can imagine taking on a family of five across three generations was no um, small undertaking for the hosts. And um, they used their time with their hosts sensibly. They were landlords, sorry, that's on there as well. So in, in, in um, Ukraine, 
they were landlords themselves. They rented out uh, an apartment in Kiev uh, or apartments. Anyway, they used their time here. They sent up six. They saved up six months worth of rent while they were here through um, work and saving, etc. As the their time at, uh, approached its end with their host at the eight month stage, they started looking around rental properties. And despite having six months rent, um, letting agents were not entertaining them at all. They weren't even offering them uh, de details of properties because they have minimal credit history. They don't have landlord references. They they they've got their own properties in Ukraine. They're not tenants normally so they don't have a tenancy history that they can report their hosts are happy to give them a reference um, they have no credit history because they're being hosted they don't have utility bills uh, the likes of Vodafone have given them a free sim um, etc etc they've they haven't made an impression on the credit history of uh, credit score people but this doesn't mean they're bad tenants um, but they're being stopped at the first hurdle in that they're not even being um, considered as tenants. Um, just as I said, it's a little bit of good news. I actually then was approached by a landlord who bought a house on um, on a buy-to-let basis and said that him and his partner wanted to help a family and did we have one? And yes, we did. Uh, got a few lined up. Um, and there were some, still some barriers that we needed to work together to overcome, but um, we worked collaboratively. We came with them. The rent they could afford was marginally less than the landlord wanted, but it was marginal. It's like £25 a month. And he was great. And he said, no, that's close enough to, you know, what I kind of wanted. Uh, he agreed to put in white goods. And then hopefully they are going to move in to their own property next week. It was going to be in the next few days, but I'm sure landlords appreciate there's been delays in getting the property up to spec and decorating and tradesmen in to do stuff. <laughs> Um, so it's been pushed back slightly, but we're looking at sometime next week rather than this week. So not a massive delay. Um, and so I, I, I'm keen to work with you where we can and find out if there are things that we, additional things we can do to overcome some of these barriers. Then tell us what they are, what your concerns are, and we will look to see whether there's something we can do to ensure that you feel com confident and happy. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So how can you help? But one, if you've got space in your own home, consider hosting someone. <laughs> so the same as everyone, whether you're a landlord or not. Um, if you're approached by existing tenants who want to host, please grant permission where you can. Hopefully applying the simple sort of checklist that the social housing providers are applying in, the, um, which I covered just before. Um, help the uh, Ukrainians overcome some of those barriers. So where your standard policy might be to have a credit reference, a landlord's reference, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have those, but that doesn't mean they're a bad tenant. So please be understanding, still consider them um, and help them through those barriers. Um, consider joint tenancies. So this is where you might have two, like I tried to explain, you might have two uh, mothers with children Technically, she's not a single mother. She just had to, or they've not single mothers. They've had to leave their pet, uh, husbands in Ukraine. And it's difficult for them to get into regular work if they've got childcare needs and the likes. But they may have a friend or, or struck up a friendship with another Ukrainian over here in a similar position. And by them moving in together, they can support each other, help look after the children together, share the bills and, and you know, have, have an easier um, life. We can work with you, and this is where I um, will go on to stuff on, on um, checking um, how we can support you and, and some um, with shared tenancies, mini HMOs, as I call them. Um, as I covered, and I just keep beating, so that no fault of their own. They might appear on paper as less desirable, but these are quite often professional people in Ukraine. They were lawyers, dentists, uh, <laughs> um, teachers, university lecturers. Um, but they have no landlord references, limited credit history, short work history, maybe on housing benefit. Um, so, and oh, there you go, it is at the bottom there. So, yeah, the private sector housing officers have said that they will offer free advice, normally a charge service, but for Homes Ukraine to help private landlords look 
uh, um, complying with mini HMO requirements. I'm not an expert or qualified, but I have spoken to the officers and they do seem fairly minimal and perfectly achievable kind of things. It's not that difficult to achieve that. Um, so, final slide, please. You'll be pleased to hear, it's a quickie. Um, so some things that we've currently put in place to try and counterback some of those concerns that landlords have had stroke support the Ukrainians. So we've got a um, deposit scheme where we can um, cover the deposit to, to help the Ukrainians um, uh, uh, guests, likewise first month's rent. Then if they've built up a month or so's rent to themselves, they can potentially you know, come with a better package to the private landlords. Um, we can reimburse a rent guarantee uh, insurance policy for the first year if you issue a 12 month uh, policy. Um, so, yeah, we, we just simply ask private landlords to get three quotes and we obviously go with the best deal. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we can reimburse that. And there, there's a reason we ask the private landlords to do it against us. As a local authority, we've got a really small pool of insurers that will look uh, entertain quoting us whereas a private landlord you've got a much bigger opening to the market um so it's better value for money um and more choice for you to get the uh, the insurance policy and us pay you back the the um the, the policy fee then then us take it out um again we go the we'll give a free property assessment advice how you might uh, turn a smaller property into a mini HMO where maybe two, only two families or three families are sharing. Um, and we want to work collaboratively. Tell us what support you need or what you think you need to overcome the barriers that are stopping them even getting through the door. Um, my only final point that's not really on a slide here was going back to the fact that we've got 30 single people here. And I know that HMO uh, owners tend to not like to mix nationalities. And we don't have any Ukrainian ones in in um, Finland, but there's a huge need because there's a, a you know a number of single people out there that really the only thing they can afford is going to be an HMO or a one bed flat, and there's not a huge amount number of those out there. So anyone who considers um, you know has a, a, is considering a new HMO or something, if they could consider making it a Ukrainian one, that would be great. Um, it's not. Uh, going to be financially worse for you. you. We're not asking you to lose money. You're a bit. You're, you're business people. You're in this to to uh, make an income and a living. But um, work with us so that we can help support this scheme. And I'm open to any questions. My email is there, and I've got a dodgy Polish heritage, so uh, not the easiest one to remember. If you want to scribble it down, on my phone number, and I'm happy to have the most informal chat or. Um, answer any questions outside of this forum, but if anyone's got any now, happy to try and answer. Rob, yes, let's take your question. I was just going to say to you, Tom, if it's of any use at any time, I don't know if it would be or not, if you have a landlord on this scheme that requires an inventory, we will do that for free for you. Absolutely. Just thank you, there go, more offers coming our way. Okay. Thank you, Rob, that's very kind. Um, I'll take Denai's question next, please. Yeah, it's just a quick. I mean, Tom, are you able to help with some basic interpreting or translating services? I mean, I know as a as a local authority, there's a huge budget for that, but but some basic stuff um, so that tenants can communicate and landlords effectively. Yes, yeah, so so part of the scheme, we've actually um, um, contracted with the Rosmini as a third party organisation. Oh, okay. Um, mm. They have Ukrainian and Russian speaking um, members of staff. Um, it sort of seems a little bit perverse sometimes, but great, most Ukrainians speak Russian, even though that's who's invading them um, of, of most ages. So uh, and, and then some prefer to speak Ukrainian rather than Russian. Um, but they've got permanent members of staff that speak Russian that are there all week. And then they've got Ukrainian members of staff who do a couple of days a week so we can make appointments and they can translate, they can help communicate things. Um, yeah, so we've got that service. Um, I'd like to send my um, thanks to all of the contributors this evening. Thank you so much um, for all of your um, uh, your support. And please, landlords, this forum is for you. Um, so 
whatever you think you might need some uh, training on, support on, advice in our next forum, which will be later on this year, probably um, towards the end of the summer, um, then please let us know. Email us in. Uh, always happy to chat, um, as you know. Um, and uh, we wish you every success in the next few months before we see you again. Um, anybody got any other comments that they want to add before we say goodbye? No, just thank you, Joe. Excellently no. organised. Much appreciated. Lovely. Well, we're fingers crossed that we might be able to actually physically see each other soon and have a cup of tea together. But let's wait and see. So <laughs> you never know. <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. OK, Bye. take care. Bye. Have a yeah, good evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.